Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 20th meeting of 2015 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Remind all present that you should have your um, mobile phones and so on on silent. Uh, they can interfere with the broadcasting system. Members of the committee may be using tablets for the business of the meeting. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. And uh, this is uh, the first item today to consider whether item eight on the agenda should be taken in private. Are we agreed? Thank you very much. We are agreed. Agenda item two is subordinate legislation. Second item uh, is to consider the draft Water, Environment and Water Services Scotland Act 2003, modification of part one, regulations 2015. The instrument has been laid under the affirmative procedure, which means the Parliament must approve it before provision uh, is, uh, may come into force. Following this evidence session, the Committee will be invited to consider the motion uh, to <coughs> approve the instrument under Agenda Item 3. And I welcome the Minister, Dr Aileen MacLeod, for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. Good morning, Aileen. And uh, Neil Ritchie, Environment, Quality, Division, uh, Scottish Government. Good morning. Minister, do you wish to speak to the instrument? Yes, I do. And uh, thank you very much, uh, convener, and uh, good morning. I'm pleased to be here today to support the committee's consideration of the Water Environment and Water Services Scotland Act 2003, modification of Part 1 Regulations 2015. This instrument is primarily a technical one, embedding the overarching requirements of three recent European directives, the Priority Substances Directive 2013, the Groundwater Directive 2014, and the Biological Monitoring Directive 2014, into our primary legislation transposing the Water Framework Directive, the requirements of the Priority Substances Directive 2013 must be transposed by the 14th of September this year. And although the Groundwater Directive 2014 and Biological Monitoring Directive 2014 are not required to be transposed until the summer of next year, 2016, we are taking this opportunity to transpose these three directives together in the interests of simplifying the number of changes to our legislative framework. I can assure the committee that this early transposition of the 2016 requirements will have no adverse implications for Scottish interests as these requirements essentially reflect the latest international best practice in monitoring and assessment practices and we are already applying these practices here in Scotland. The requirements of the Priority Substances Directive are, on a first reading, potentially more challenging, but the focus of this directive is a requirement for certain hazardous substances to be banned or phased out with the aim of significantly reducing their harmful effects on our freshwater and marine environments. This directive places a strong emphasis on product control rather than increased treatment at wastewater treatment plants. And the good news is that many of these substances have already been banned at a European or a UK level and the use of others is already declining and less harmful products have emerged onto the market. We will, uh, convener, continue to press the European Commission and the UK Government as appropriate to take action to ban the remaining substances. Meanwhile, I have tasked both SEPA and Scottish Water to work together to identify any pollution hotspots caused by the residual effects of these substances and to consider where additional wastewater treatment may be necessary, feasible and proportionate in order to prevent or at least limit these substances from causing any further harm to our precious freshwater and marine environments. And I would ask the committee to support this instrument. <coughs> Thank you, Minister. Um, I wonder if there are any questions for the Minister at the moment. Yes, um, there are several questions. So, Alec Ferguson, followed by Mike Russell, followed by Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Vida, and good morning, Minister, and thank you for your introductory remarks. I just wanted to ask you uh, one question, which um, in the explanatory notes we've been given, it says that all three directives introduced revised monitoring and assessment provisions, which you just um, explained. But you also described that as potentially more challenging. Um, the note then goes on to say these high-level amendments will be of limited interest to stakeholders. Now, if they are high-level and challenging, 
Um, I just wonder if you could explain why they are therefore not of great interest to stakeholders, because it seems to me that it will be very largely up to stakeholders to ensure that these um, new challenges are met. So can you assure us that um, there is unlikely to be any possibility of an increased regulatory burden on stakeholders as a result of these changes? Yes, I can give you that assurance. Um, the impacts of these changes will be fairly limited uh, in Scotland because, as I already said in my opening remarks, many of these uh, substances have already been banned at a European or a UK level or they are currently uh, being phased out. Others now have a limited uh, use in Scotland, although the main exception is uh, tributylene which is uh, TBT and its compounds, and we are in the early stages of discussion with the UK government regarding uh, a possible ban. The implications for business are minimal. The vast majority, as I say, of these substances have already been withdrawn from use and the other, product, other products have been replaced on the market. And I know that there was um, some issues around on the cyber methadone, um, one of the pesticides which historically had been very important in dealing with um, sheep scab, but that is not something that's actively uh, used in agriculture and that has been effectively phased out uh, through the market uh, 10 years ago. OK, thanks for that explanation. I just want to follow that up a little because in inevitably in any list of, of, of substances there will be one or two which people don't think too much about and suddenly discover uh, it has a use. Um, have, uh, has, have your officials, uh, perhaps with the Commission, analysed each of the substances? How many of them are there? And what their actual uses are? Because I would simply be concerned, I think nobody objects to this regulation, but I would be concerned that lurking in there is one that somebody's going to discover is absolutely essential for their work, and that will cause some difficulties. Uh, just adding to that, I think it's a very good point. The... Uh, Two to three years ago, there was a very extensive period of negotiation of the priority substances directive through the uh, European Commission working group processes. A lot more substances were originally on the list or have been worked through that system, either dropped out or have been identified as ones that we need to watch rather than priority substances for action now. So we have been through that uh, process both at the European level and in terms of informing the development of the guidance to SEPA, who have the bulk of the additional work and the consequences as part of their monitoring programme. We have been engaging with key sectors to understand any impact and also give them warning of the changes that are coming up. How many substances are there? There's 20. 20. <laughs> right. Would it be possible, without adding greatly to your regulatory burden, to have a, a list of them and the list of their uses? just in case uh, you know, this committee might want to look in case any of its stakeholders are adversely affected. Yes. We're very happy to supply that. I mean, the list that we have at the moment, the types of use are around pesticides, industrial combustion products, biocide, metal, um, and sort of shipbuilding as well as maintenance of public toilets as well. But we're very happy to provide that list to the committee. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Then Thank you, convener. Good, good morning, Minister, and to yourself, um, Neil. Uh, it, it's within the same uh, sort of ethos, the, the question really, uh, of the previous two. Could I ask, um, in view of the importance of having very um, pristine water for all sorts of reasons, um, per se, but also for a range of um, industries in, in Scotland um, related to um, food products as well, um, if, if there are new substances that come on onto... Will those, will those be considered in, uh, in, in the future, or does that have to come back to us? You know, if, if, uh, sometimes things come with a different name. I'm thinking of the neonicotinoid issue yeah. on land and things like yeah. that. Yeah. The priority substances are something that's kept under regular review at the European level, and as I understand it, are a suite of uh, reviews that are done before new products are allowed to be uh, placed onto the commercial marketplace in terms of understanding potential impacts. Right, thank you. Good morning, Minister. Um, you mentioned 20 substances that would have some of them used in toilets, shipbuilding, pesticides. The, the, the note, you said there's no adverse implications, limited interest to stakeholders and not consulted widely on our proposals. I just wonder how wide... Uh, how widely you have and who you have consulted with, because obviously 20 substances and 
Uh, as I said, uh, you've mentioned uh, about three or four areas that, that uh, have used these substances. I just wonder uh, how widely you did consult and with what, which organisations. Uh, first of all, it's probably worth just reiterating that the Scottish Government didn't identify these substances as cells. These were the ones that were proposed by the European Commission. Uh, and during the uh, passage of the directives through Brussels, I know that there was significant stakeholder involvement, uh, engagement both within Scotland with key interests, ad sites, Scottish Water in particular, given the implications for them. But I am also conscious there was significant involvement from EU-wide uh, organisations, for example, and San Copa Cabana on the farming side of the group of uh, farming unions was involved in the process. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I might want to add just to that, obviously, because obviously one of the responsible authorities is with Scottish Water, uh, and we did um, consult with Scottish Water, and they were content with our proposed approach. Okay, uh, no more further questions just now. In that case, move to agenda item three, uh, subordinate legislation, uh, with consideration of a uh, motion S4M13314, asking for the committee to recommend approval of the Affirmative Instrument, the Water, Environment and Water Services Scotland Act 2003, Modification of Part 1, Regulations 2015 Draft. Uh, we can now move into a formal process, uh, which hopefully won't take the 90 minutes that is there allotted uh, for this particular item. People in the gallery may be happy to know it's unlikely, but you never know. Um, so, I invite the Minister to speak to and move the motion. I Minister. formally moved, Convener. Thank you. Uh, are there any members who wish to uh, make any statement? If not, uh, you've formally moved. Wind up. No wind up. No wind up. Thank you very much. So, I put the question now. The question is that the motion S4M 13314 in the name of Aileen MacLeod be approved. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. So we will make that uh, report uh, of that and we thank Aileen and her official just now. Thank you. Fourth item on the agenda for the committee is to consider two negative instruments as listed on the agenda. Uh, Rural Development Scotland Regulations 2015 SSI 2015 192 and the Rural Payments Appeals at Scotland Regulations 2015 SSI 2015-194. I refer members to the paper. Are there any comments, members? Alec Ferguson. Second instrument, convener. Um, my, my reading of it is that this is really simply replacing the appeal system, <clears throat> replacing the current appeal system and putting it into the new CAP support system. Is that, is that your understanding as that well? That would be my understanding as well, yes. Yeah, that's all right. But, uh, do we have any other comments? Other uh, than that, I've, I've no problems with it. You have uh, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. It was just to highlight on the first one that um, the business and regulatory impact assessment is being prepared, and I just wondered if there was a time scale for that, because it seems like if, there may, if it's worth having a BRIA, that it's kind of worth having it available because there are quite a lot of regulations, even though they have many of them have already been in, in, enforced we, before. We can write to the Minister and ask for right. an, an explanation of that. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Boyack. Thanks very much, Convener. I was just wanting to ask a brief question about the um, implications of the Land Court um, in terms of how the appeals are expected to operate, whether um, I note the reference to legacy. Um, schemes, whether there's, expect, whether there's been analysis of the capacity in the land court and in terms of the time it takes to actually deal with these appeals, um, if there's any work being done on that. Uh, so we should try and ask for answers about that as well. I think Please. that's right. It's regularly noticed here that the land court seems to be coming into focus and seems to be requiring to do more work. So I think it would be a good Skills. Yep. Good, good thing for us to know. So I think we've got captured that. Any other points on these two instruments? Um, if not, can I ask whether the committee has agreed that it doesn't wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments, apart from writing? 
to the Minister for those clarifications. We are agreed yep. unanimously. Thank you very much. I right, move on to agenda item uh, five, and uh, this will require us to uh, uh, sort of rejig the room just now. So we'll need to make a short uh, break, and we shall do that so that the uh, guests can come and take their place. Good, good morning to item, agenda item five is to take oral evidence on the common agriculture policy implementation in Scotland, specifically on the application process. We're joined by a panel of witnesses and I welcome everyone to the meeting and point out that the sound is uh, controlled centrally, uh, so you don't need to be switching anything on or off. And uh, when you are uh, wanting to speak, just indicate, and we'll keep a list of people and we'll call people in as well as we can. Uh, so I welcome uh, you all. I'll just get everyone to introduce themselves. I'm the convener of the committee, Rob Gibson, MSP for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross. And uh, going round the table to Sarah, first of all. Uh, Sarah Boyack, uh, Labour member for the Lothians. Uh, Dave Tucker, farmer from West Stirlingshire. Claudia Beamish, MSP for South Scotland and Shadow Minister for Environment and Climate Change. Alison Milne, farmer from Fife. Uh, Dave Thompson, MSP for Skylar Harbour and Barnock. 
Charlie Adam, farmer from Aberdeenshire and chairman of the NFUS Livestock Committee. And Mike Russell when he comes back. Alan Patterson, uh, land agent uh, from Castle Douglas. Scott Henderson, I'm farmer from Dumfries, but I'm also chairman of the Scottish Beef Association. Um, I'm Alex Ferguson, the um, constituency member for Galloway and West Dumfries. Michelle MacDonald, farmer in the Borders, and I'm also working for Scott EIT. Uh, Jim Hume, MSP for South Scotland. Jenny Douglas, I, an agent for Seed Co in the Borders. Good morning, I'm Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East. And Russell Smith, crofter from Boner Bridge in Sutherland and director of the Scottish Crofting Federation. Uh, I'm Graeme Day, the MSP for Angus South. Thank you very much, everybody. Well, um, I'm just going to kick this off to try and get some of your views about what we're talking about. What is going on that has got people uh, into a considerable lather about the way in which this new uh, application system is working? Would anyone like to explain their experience at the moment, uh, just to kick us off, because then we'll hear a few of these and others will come in. Jenny Douglas, first hand up. Um, I, as I say, am an agent and deal with a lot of different applications for different farmers. Um, the problem with the system is, to begin with, I think it's well known, it was very, very slow, it didn't work. Um, we couldn't even log in. When you can't, when the system goes down, all the guidance goes down. So you can't even sit and read what you should be doing as a farmer. Everything was offline. It then started to speed up merely May, so about three weeks ago. But there's still quite a lot of problems. You can't access maps very well. If you've got a larger farm that you're not uploading, you need to come out of what you're doing to go and look at that. So you can't have them as a parallel. So they're, you're logging out of doing the application to look at your maps, really. And quite a lot of the time we're finding the maps are not uploading um, to see them. So we're needing to ask for maps. Um, there are errors going forward when you move on to the next field. It's showing you areas from the fields before. And it hangs. And if you're deleting a field, it might delete two fields at once. And you need to work this out and add that field back in. Um, and there's incompatibility to SRDP. So when we're trying to claim um, people who have got grant schemes they're saying they're incompatible with also claiming BPS, which isn't true. And so we're being asked to hold off submitting. We're holding off submitting and the system's getting slower now. There's still 50% of Scotland need to submit and the system's getting slower and slower again. And we're worried we're going to have to go back to paper copies again two weeks for the deadline. Okay, right. Somebody else. Charlie Adam. Thank you. Uh, thanks number of points. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, you mentioned guidance and not being able to access it. I would have to say that from a farmer's point of view, it's not just not being able to access it. It isn't there to access. From a very simple point of view, uh, there is absolutely no instruction from the off as to what route to follow, simply to even get started and to follow through. And also, there is a complete failure, as I can see, to return to pages without finding oneself back to square one and no guidance even then how to get restarted. So at that level, that, that, I mean, that, that is appalling. And I'm somebody who has uh, jumped at applying online from the very word go and found the system previously to be user-friendly, intuitive, and not a problem. So uh, I would say in the position that we're in, where we desperately want people to take up IT, do things online, and communicate electronically, this is a tremendously retro retrograde step because anybody starting in this will have all their fears about doing so if they haven't done it before, confirmed and uh, reinforced. Uh, in addition to that, I, mean, I don't know where to stop, frankly, because the, the, there are so many things to say. But uh, 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 at the other end, uh, um, I was consulting with a consultant involved who currently said that uh, the system was handling about 300 cases per day. Uh, and... Uh, he informed me that we would have to achieve 600 per day between now and the 15th of June in order to complete. Now, I know the system has speeded up, but certainly from personal experience yesterday, the system uh, failed in the afternoon. I've had an email today uh, through Gerald Banks from David Barnes saying that this was a small outage, but uh, myself and someone else in this room who were communicating and trying to get on at a time when we were being told the system was now improved, found it wasn't working at all. 
So uh, there's a major concern as to whether or not the information uh, being passed to senior people within the, the government or within the civil service is actually accurate in terms of the failings of the system. And frankly, we're heading potentially for a, a serious mess. I, I, I'd like to come back later, but I think I've probably said enough just now. Thank you. Well, that'll do for a beginning, yes, indeed. But other people, uh, please tell us what you think. Michelle, do you want to tell us something? I don't know where to start, to be really honest. It has been a nightmare. I'm very comfortable using a computer. I've used a computer for 30 years. I use it in my job. I couldn't even get on for four weeks to register. Mm -hmm. I was unable to access the site for four weeks. Two phone calls to our local office. You know, what do I do? And they apologised. They, they were fairly mortified that I wasn't able to do it. They said, persevere, just keep trying. I got to the end of February, and I said, and this is ridiculous. I must be able to get on. I'm going to start alarming. It's, it's impossible. And I was told, using the website uh, link address that we were all sent out, tried it, and I said, well, please, can I just try it whilst you're on the phone? Yes, that's fine. Obviously didn't work. And she said... Um, what we found is you go into Google toolbar and put rural payments in and you get to the same link. And I said, looking at it, it's the same link as I've been using and I've been unable to use it. She said, try it through Google and I managed to get onto it. Four weeks it took to get to that stage. Can right, I, can who I? else wants to kick in? Alan uh, Patterson first and then Scott. Can I, uh, Ms. Camille, can I echo um, Mr. Adams' sentiments? We're all looking to move this forward with an IT. Um, I work as a land agent and submit a large number of IACSs. Last year, online, the online system was user-friendly. It had its problems, but it was fairly user-friendly. And personally, I submitted 185 claims online. At the moment, we've been trying to use the IT system, which is not user-friendly, crashes all the time, we lose information, there's incompatible crop codes, rural priorities, anyone with a rural priorities contract, you can upload in the system, but when you get to the end, the validation system, it will not let you submit it. Time is now pressing, we've had an extension, we're moving towards the 15th of June. Uh, we are all sitting with various submissions on our computers that we cannot submit. Unfortunately, we have now had to take the decision to write them out manually and submit them to the area office so that we have a receipt to say that the farmer's submission is in. The upshot of that is when they're submitted, whether on paper or online, one of the worrying things is if a farmer phones us tomorrow and said, I've made a mistake with a field number, I need to make an amendment to my staff. We cannot amend it online, but neither can the rural, pri eh, the rural payment staff. Nobody can, admit, eh, can alter a staff once it's submitted at the moment. We were told that, that this would alter in April, then we were told it would alter in May, and we were told again it would alter in June. There are recorded deliveries and emails being sent to the local area offices, who I must say that area staff have been tremendous to try and help everybody. But the fact of the matter is, once that submit button is pressed, with up to 100 validation errors on an electronic submission, you cannot alter it. Thank you. Uh, Scott, next. Uh, convener. Um, I'll just give you a short uh, precy of my history with it. I managed to get registered uh, with the system on the 19th of January, but it took basically from turn of the year until that date to do it. Um, I started to fill my staff form in on the 2nd of April, and uh, I completed it yesterday. That's fully two months uh, since I started. Last year, I did it electronically as well, online, uh, and it took me, I did it within the space of one working day. We had a perfectly workable system last year um, that you could see what you were doing, changing the changes you were making. You could see on the on the form as you went through, 
As soon as you make an alteration on the present system, it disappears and you have no idea whether it's been logged on to the system or not. Um, I said I submitted my form yesterday. Um, I have some carryover land managers options from the previous system. They were five years. You did commit to the thing for five years. Uh, one have for farm dikes. Um, these were picked up on the, the la on the land parcels uh, on the form. Well, I say picked up. There was one missing. I had a, a, another part of the land manager's options was overwintered uh, overwinter stubbles. Um, they they have been picked up on the form, but they're not registered on the summary page. And it, I've been sitting with my staff form completed all but that section for a fortnight, and if I. A countless numbers of phone calls back and forward to local staff, and I just emphasise or reinforce what Alan said, they've been most helpful, and it was only yesterday that I was given a reassurance that despite an apparent mistake on the form, it was registered on the system that I had uh, made this observation. Uh, there have been countless errors where things are not, it's not adding things up correctly. They tried to sell the system to us on the fact that it would check as it went along. Well, the checking procedure wasn't right. The addition, additions were wrong, particularly in your greening, which were um, dependent on uh, the area you greened could have various weighting factors, and it didn't seem to take that into account um, when, you were, when you were logging on. So, I mean, after three different, um, three different ways of achieving my greening, one at point three, one at point seven, and one at one point five, and it seemed to be difficult for it to do that. It seems to be doing that correctly now. Uh, it has speeded up. There's no no doubt about that, but there's still issues outstanding with it, and we haven't got round to the procedure where uh, our officials will be checking forms, and goodness knows what will happen when we get to the other end, when we all hope we'll be getting paid out of the scheme. I just, I, it just appears that the whole system has been introduced before it's fit for purpose, and we just question, and certainly our, our organisation questions whether the other sections of it will be fit for purpose when they come to get used. Thank you. Uh, uh, Russell Smith. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, uh, I'll make two or three points just now, and then I've got more detailed evidence if you want to hear it later. But the Scottish Crofting Federation emailed round our members to ask for comments. And if I summarise that briefly just now, out of 27 members who replied saying they had used the online system, 24 of them criticised it for various reasons. Uh, and that raised a lot of points which have been come up here already about it is just not intuitive and questions about did practitioners, did farmers actually test it or who tested it. Also, another theme coming out in the replies was that, as again has been said, the department staff have always been very helpful, every, and that's over the whole of the North, the Highlands and Islands. And third point to make initially is that myself and certainly all my immediate neighbours just filled it in on paper because we could see this coming and we didn't want to be part of it. Uh, now, Alison Milne, and then... Uh, uh, Tucker. Um, I'll start with uh, perhaps controversially something positive. I think it's been said by a couple of people, but I appreciate the effort and the sentiment that's gone into the system um, from you know, across the board, uh, Scottish Government staff, and I think some of their frustrations are exactly the same as, as ours, but unfortunately that doesn't change the reality for, for us as farmers on the ground. I would agree with everything that's, that's been said, and from a personal point of view, I haven't found the system to be intuitive, um, and I have individual um, technical issues which I'm trying to resolve at the moment, but I think it's, it's evident that we could write a list after list of all the technical issues that, that there are. My greatest fear is that history would suggest that administrative errors are treated in exactly the same way as somebody who's pur purposely falsely declared. And I think there's a huge level of fear amongst people rightly, um, because evidence has shown that, that people have been penalised for such things. Um, and 
personally, um, and from a STFA point of view, it would be nice to know that there was some reassurance that errors were going to be treated in a different way than they have done previously. Fair point. And the uh, day Tucker? Um, yes, I could just endorse everything that everybody has said, although I've been lucky enough not to experience all of it, simply because my, my own farm is a very simple farm. It's, it's nearly all permanent grass. Um, the only other change is a third of the farm is in trees, so trees is a nice simple one. Um, the hedging was one that confused me because apparently it's to be regarded as permanent grass which was a surprise to me, but I'm very happy with that. Um, I don't get involved in the greening, which a lot of farmers will have to, so again, that's simple for me. Um, I managed to register after hours and hours and um, help <coughs> from the local office uh, in February, February the 11th. Um, it then took me until May the 11th to get my SAF stuff sitting on the couch with my own physical hard map there um, because you couldn't do it online. Um, but we were advised to use our maps, the hard copy maps. Um, but the, the, the field locations weren't in the same order on the map as they are online. So that proved a problem. And then... I found that the errors were caused because some of my field locations were identical to each other. And in my old brain, I got confused and I put um, permanent grass when it should have been trees uh, and stuff like that. But eventually I got there and I managed to get the whole thing done on the 11th of May. And I can see the potential once we get the hang of it but only because I've got a very simple, straightforward farm and I'm all region one. What it must be like with people who've got different regions and different areas and, and, and cropping, it must be an absolute nightmare. My biggest worry, though, is although the staff are wonderful at the local offices and try to be very helpful, they have only been supplied with the same guidance as we farmers have been supplied with. So there's a degree of interpretation in what the guidelines are. For instance, all the youngsters who are coming in um, as starter farmers have been told they enter in at uh, 2013 activity. But they weren't advised that they should also tick the box for, um, uh, what, what, what was the next one again? Um, New hmm? New no, uh, no. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm a bit dippy. But anyway, that, that meant the difference between if they were only doing the activity in 2013 or if, if they had started before 2013, they would come in in 2014 as, with nothing and they'd get only a fifth of the regional average and then it would go up incrementally a fifth up until 2019, which meant they would be put on a further unlevel playing field. When the reality was fortunately confirmed by David Barnes in an email, which I shared with the Forestry Commission starter farmers, um, that, no, they will come in at the regional average so long as they go into the, um, this next box, which is it's the National Reserve. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that. Right, Charlie Adam again. Thank you for back, convener. Um, just two points uh, which I think are quite important. Firstly, I'm led to believe, uh, well, I know that there is a, an admission of a greening calculation problem which is on the site, and I'm led to believe that a number of people have done applications and got to the point where the system tells them that they have met their greening requirements. They have then completed the submission and, as far as they're aware, done it correctly and gone off to plough a field or whatever it is, no longer worried. However, because of this miscalculation, it turns out that these applications do not meet the greening requirement and therefore, upon scrutiny, will be subject, presumably, to penalty, which might be quite severe. 
Uh, two points related to that are, one, that uh, as far as I'm aware, no, no person who's made such an application will have been informed, and there doesn't appear to be a system in place to inform them before the deadline that their application is not valid and needs to be revisited. I'm actually led to believe that revisiting at the moment isn't even possible. Uh, so that is potentially very serious, and of course I would um, endorse what um, Day Tucker said, that uh, given that these things may happen, that the idea that someone might have a penalty because of something like that happening through no fault of their own would be completely unacceptable. The second thing I wanted to mention was to do with mapping. Uh, we are, a lot of the problems are arising because of extremely frequent remapping of farms, changing of field numbers, right up until the present day so that somebody can be filling up a form while there's a new map actually sitting in their email that they haven't even opened yet or in the post. And in my case, I had a remap five and a half months ago completed, but the system is still showing up errors related to uh, the fields that were remapped and includes fields which actually record land, the same land twice. Uh, so uh, uh, I would say it is almost essential for in the future that remapping must stop before the whole business of doing this application ever starts and, and that the effects of remapping must be completely up to date on the system before anybody opens up the system to make an application. Okay. Um, Jenny Douglas. Um, yes, same, same thing. Where this, the problem is, and the sad thing is, we are all trying to... I was very much... Um, for the online system, but farmers are really losing faith in the Scottish Government and feel that they are out to get them. Uh, they'll get it wrong and they're going to get penalised for it and they're all getting a little bit bitter and it's trying to... And then you see these press releases that are saying we're doing so well, we're 48% towards the target, two weeks before the deadline, actually three weeks beyond the deadline, and it's, it's creating um, something it shouldn't have. But, I mean, I... For the ones we are doing, because of all the problems with the maths that it's generating, we are doing spreadsheets. So before we even start doing the online system, we are finding the easiest way to have some confidence in it is to do all of the information ourselves, calculate everything, and then input that field by field. And if those figures balance with our figures, then you have a bit more confidence in it because you cannot print what you've done in any sort of sense. Um, it deletes the column with the field name and it puts them in a random order. So you've got to go through them all. And when you've got 198 fields, it takes quite a long time to work out which field's which. And every time you reprint it, it scrambles the order again. And you don't get any totals on the sheet at all. All you get is some information. So that is no check. And our farmers are asking us to give them a printout of their claim, like we always did, a PDF. And all I'm doing is screen dumps. Before I submit something, I screen dump to show them, well, at least we have something. But I don't know what fallback we have for it. And it's just a bit of a frustration. Well, just, just to break this down, are there many <laughs> farms with 198 fields? Yes. We've got yes. quite a lot. Yeah. Every quite a hedge lot. now, if a, field's got, if a farm's got an SRDP, for mm -hmm. example, and got hedges around it, that's five parcels. Every hedge is a different LPID around one field. So that's five for every one. Um, we've got two simple gra one of them's a simple grassland, and it's gone up by seventy-eight field by sorry forty-eight fields, um, by every little thing. So we've seen a lot with a huge increase this year, um, and some of them are not matching. The online system is generated before the map is generated, so the fields on the online system don't exist anymore. Talking about fields, as in computing fields, rather than as an LPID, sorry, the actual field, the yep. field identifiers. Uh, okay. to do, again, to do with the remapping side of things. OK. Um, Angus MacDonald's got a question just now. Um, oh, is that right? OK, right. Well, we're going to have to move on to some things in a minute that start to ask, you know, what we, we try to do. But uh, probably Alec Ferguson wants to say something. And then Russell, yes? Alec? Um, and I must say, every, everything that everybody said backs up what I've been told within my constituency and beyond. Um, uh, and from that point of view, is extremely useful. But I, I, somebody mentioned, I can't remember who it was, forgive me, the number of submissions that have already been received. It, I think it was uh, Mr. Adam, yeah. Uh, and there are clearly still a lot to go in the limited time available to us. I wonder if it's possible to say how many of those submissions, it, this may not be for this panel, but how many submissions have been made on paper rather than online? And also whether it's possible 
possible uh, in, in, in the experience of people on the panel? When you've submitted the form, is that the end of the problems, or is that to a certain extent when the problems start? Um, because if it's when the problems start, then the number of submissions is actually a bit irrelevant if that's when uh, there are still a number of issues remaining. Um, Alan, a moment, Russell Smith wanted to speak because it's related so, yeah. to that. Oh, well, unless you want to come back directly well, on that point, and then that I'll. Point from Alan Patterson, then Russell Smith, then Mike Russell. Come back to. Uh, Mr. Ferguson's point, the problems are just starting. Unfortunately, we've lost sight that we've had a month's extension. We've always been able to put our SAFs in, whether on paper or online, hopefully online, and we've had a grace period where we can amend the SAF. They have now given us an extension for one month to the 15th of June, but you cannot amend your SAF after that. There is no amendment period. There is no period of grace where a man submits his form on the 14th of June and says, oh dear, I've made a mistake, and realises it on the 16th. That cannot be amended. Well, these are the kind of questions we intend to ask. I mean, when we, get, we, we start to uh, hear yeah. what you're saying, <laughs> uh, the point about this hearing is not just to let off steam, or uh, quite rightly, as you're doing, but to find some solutions to these things, and that's what this is all about. So what you're saying is one of the things that will feed into that for sure. Your fears need to be answered, need to be... Uh, the, greening, the greening issue that Mr Arnum mentioned, there actually has been an agent's update to say that there is a problem on the system with the greening, which has been acknowledged. Right. Uh, Russell. Thank, thanks, Convener. I would say that I... I personally did register online, but it took me two goes to go it, despite having, say, 45 years' experience working with computers and having a fairly simple croft. We have two and a half pages of fields, and we've got no greening, and it's, yeah, it's all fairly straightforward. Uh, when it came to the IAX, I looked at it, and I read the reports in the press, and again, with knowledge of introducing new computer systems, I made a, a positive decision not to use the computer system and just to fill in the paper forms as we've done in the past. And they're a bit different, but you know, that was that was a couple of hours sitting down at the kitchen table with, with the maps and the forms and was fine. Uh, I did with the new system, having some taken the forms into the Goldsby office, got a receipt for it, I then received an email saying that there was a communication for me. So that Friday evening, I tried several times to log on to the system and failed. I tried several times on the Saturday and couldn't log on to the system. I tried first thing Sunday morning and couldn't log on. And the second attempt on the Sunday morning, I, I could log on. And I eventually found my way through the screens to this communication, uh, which was, as expected, was just an acknowledgement that I'd handed it in. It was fine. Uh, but I then received a paper copy in the post on Monday morning. So I received an email, it was on the system, and I received a paper copy as well. Uh, but we did, as I said before, we sent an email round our members to see what their experiences were, knowing we're coming here. And of the people who replied, 31% uh, of them, which 19 people, actually use an agent which for crofts I find a bit worrying if the system is so difficult that people with crofts have got to use agents. Uh, 27 people said they filled it in online and only three of them didn't make a criticism of the system or didn't have problems in some extent. 14, which is a quarter of the people, did fill them in in paper. We also had two people who replied saying that the system was too confusing and they were, as a result, they were not claiming, which I find very worrying. And I, I know one of the one of these people who is, uh, you know, both him and his wife, fairly sharp people. It's not a, it's not a problem that they can't understand what's going on. But some of the quotes that we did get back, and if you, I'll go through some of them, if you don't mind. Uh, I tried to use the online system, too complicated, error messages at every step, gave, after spending, gave up after spending far too much time on it, whereas they had to use the old system, 
went to the local office, always helpful, and got a paper form. Pity they did not test the system with some real users before going live. Again, I used the online system. It took six attempts to complete. I had to delete the first five, as there were too many errors. I also helped a further five people to do their IAX form, and each application took one hour, which sounds quite good by <laughs> their experiences. Uh, apart from being so slow as to be worse than useless, the system is not at all intuitive, which has come up before, and you seem to need to know what you're doing before you start. There are no hints and tips as to what you need to do and does not seem to have been designed with any input from an actual user. Again, the second attempt, I filled it out easily enough after I stopped worrying about perfection. <laughs> Another one, I would never attempt it myself. Too much chance to make a mess or to make a mess. It is fundamentally wrong that people find the process so difficult they have to pay a consultant or agent. Can we uh, just stop you there because so, there's a lot in this. Um, it might be useful, if you wish, to give us a kind of summary submission from the yep. SCF uh, that would be very helpful because, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're hearing a kind of general picture of this and it's very useful to have the, the crofting ones and you've been able to do that sort of uh, yeah. in a summary form, whereas we've got a lot of individuals here, yeah. Can I give two reasonably positive ones at the end of that? Well, well why not, yes. yes. And said it was reasonably straightforward, but the website is unwieldy and awkward to navigate. That's a positive one. Uh, and overall, I think it is a good system as long as it is snag free. And even of our agri -pol policy group, we had, who are, I won't say experts, but at least have looked at these things. Uh, one, David, uh, tried and failed. One succeeded. And two others of us used paper kind of a summary which I'm sure many would agree. Now, there are several people who want to ask questions, I suspect, and then we'll bring uh, our witnesses in as well. Mike Russell, followed by Claudia Beamish, and Sarah Boyack and Jim Hume all want to ask questions, so let's see where it takes us. And, uh, uh, there Liam. are a couple of things I'd like to know uh, in the light of what I've heard. Firstly, if somebody can tell me what happens after you've filled it in and you've, you think you've completed. Is it then checked there and then? Do you get an email to say, that's fine? Is it still to be checked? Will you not know until after the 15th of June? That's the first question. Um, and the second one is, and this is very subjective, but I think it's worth asking, what's the difference between the people who say, well, actually, it worked fine for me, and are they logging on at 3 o'clock on a Sunday morning and the system works well because there's nobody else on? Um, What's the difference between them and those who are so frustrated that they decided that they can't go ahead with it? Is there anything, is it because they've done it later rather than starting in February or trying to start in February? Are they only just doing it now? I'm just trying to get to the bottom of that one. And the final point is, I suppose what really matters here is that people get paid in December. And whatever the problems are of a system that's you know, struggling, clearly struggling, a, everything that the government does has to be focused on making sure people are paid. And would people want to reflect on how that could be done, given the difficulties we're in? Right. Anyone want to respond to that? Charlie Adam? I, I, just briefly, because I think the others will have things that I don't know about. But I think part of the application process difficulty will depend on the nature of your farm and, and which specific things you do or don't have to apply. I've heard of people who've got a straightforward farm with no greening and who have not had a problem. Also, I'm a night owl. And 3 a.m. in the morning definitely works uh, at, uh, when 3 p.m. in the afternoon probably doesn't. So there's a capacity problem, I think. What does happen in terms of checking? What, 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 you presumably know more about this than most. Well, when, uh, I believe when the IAX is submitted online, there's a self-checking process at the end that they call validation and verification. And the validation and verification is when the errors or warnings get thrown up. Sometimes, for example, if you have a field that's 10 hectares and there's a ditch runs through it and there's a bit of a quarry in it, you may only, for safety's sake, claim 9.8. So you put 0.2 of a hectare as ineligible. That creates a warning, a validation and a verification. So that's three things on the one field when you go to submit can you override those? Can you yes. just ignore them? It has a drop-down list where you can say that you're increasing 
the ineligible area in the field. We don't know whether we're increasing it for this year or we're increasing it as time goes forward. But you can do that. Then when you get to the end, it brings down another summary. And if you have anything complicated, just as was said, a very simple farm with 10 or 12 fields that are all grass and a livestock farm maybe isn't a big issue. But someone that's doing cropping, that has a rural priorities contract or land manager's options that continue on. Unfortunately, there is a big problem with compatibility between the crop codes. And so at that moment, sorry, can I, can I just press you a little because I just want to understand this. At that moment, when you're presented with this list, right, what do you do? Do you carry on and finish the job and get it submitted? And does that mean it is submitted? If or you can. If you can. If you Sometimes can. Sometimes it won't let you. Sometimes it won't let you. If there's a compatibility issue with the crop codes, it will not let you submit the form. It will let you ve validate and verify certain things. That's what I said kind of earlier on, that we have them sitting in our computers, that it won't let us submit, so we're having to submit them on paper. We're having to take them out, delete them and write them out. But suppose you, you press a button, it's all in. Is that a guarantee that it's all in and OK? Or will, can, does somebody come back to you? Jenny is obviously going to answer this. Does somebody come back to you and say, hang on, paragraph 61 we is wrong? We will find out usually in about November, in the old scheme, in between August and November, if there's a problem by getting a letter saying you've made this error, here's a potential. And the letter always says we're going to fine you, but if it's depending on the size of it, you often don't get a fine, but the farmers get quite wide every time. So you don't find out until much later in the year if there's a problem. And by that point, that's them trying to assess it to get the payments ready. By that point, it's far too late to make these changes and you just get your knuckles wrapped or get a penalty. Um, we get a letter saying you've submitted, here's your submission number. And now we wait and see what the end result is. We don't ha we don't see any more than that now. So if if there is something deliberately or accidentally wrong on the form, you won't know that no. for a long period of time until the department process them and come back to us. And in the old scheme, that still took a few months. In this scheme, I don't know how long that'll take. Okay. Alice, from an individual perspective on completing the form, I fill out all of my field details, and then once I get to the end, I've got 18 validation errors which the principle of that is, is great because it allows me to go back and, and correct them, assuming that the validation errors are all working correctly. Um, so that is, that's great. The biggest problem, I think, is the lack of guidance because sometimes it's not very easy to interpret the validation error. You know, I'll sit and read it three or four times and I'm thinking, what does, what does that actually mean? And then I refer back to the guidance and there isn't any. Um, so we're left in a position where, you know, we just have to make our own judgment call or phone the department on that and hope that we can get an answer. So if we're looking for solutions in the short time that we've got available, one of the best things would be uh, frequently asked questions. You know, we, we've often used that in the past with different schemes where farmers give their questions and the department supply the answer. That would be, from a personal point of view, I would find that really helpful. But the big issue for everybody will be getting paid on time. No yes. matter all of us, that's the priority. Yes. A number of members who want to ask questions, so it doesn't mean that everyone has to answer because we've got flavour of quite a lot. But first of all, it's Claudia Beamish and then Sarah Boyack. Right. Uh, thank you, convener. And I'm not going to go into the details of um, issues that were raised at the Clyde and Forth NFU meeting that I attended last Friday, which um, Day was also at, because um, the, they, they really bear out, I think, I hope mm. you agree with me, I want to put words in your mouth, if, you know, the, the points being made around the table bear that out, but uh, I, I just would like that recorded. But there were two points that haven't come up yet, which um, just within the, the discussion today I'd, I'd appreciate comment on if people feel that it's significant. That um, obviously people are, farmers are having to make phone calls to get advice if they're not getting the guidance in frequently asked, asked questions or whatever. And I understand um, that there's some concern about um, differing um, advice being given depending on who you speak to when you phone up the department. For instance, um, the example given last Friday was from a new entrant who got uh, advice from someone, as he put it, um, fairly down the hierarchy, and then when he asked somebody else um, who was higher up, as he understood it, 
when he was passed on, he was given different information. And I just wonder if, um, you know, that might just be a last straw for people if, if they don't have any guidance and then they're phoning up and they're getting differing views. And that's something that would obviously need to be highlighted. The other thing is people taking their computers into local offices and wanting to do um, their... their application there and then with some guidance and there was positive um, uh, talk last Friday about um, the support that's being given but um, I understand that at one local office that uh, people are not able to use their own um, laptops and connect with the Wi-Fi and do it there and then with advice and I just wonder about that point as well. Thank you. points made. Is there anything that needs to be answered for those or, or added to? Is that Experiences that of Claudia's questions are. Like the, the bit about advice from different officers having different advice. I, one of our clients in a agronomy company, so we'll go across Scotland and give advice on these things. So we speak to different uh, area offices, and it's very, very. You get different answers. I've had four different answers. I found so there's a lot of scarily officers giving out advice to farmers that's completely against the rules and you find out about it and get it fixed. So I don't know how can one person perhaps be allocated. I know it's a big job, but it's either people, if people don't know the answer, they need to be kept quiet. Um, if there's a way that can be fixed, because that's worrying. If, if people trust the department's advice, uh, a lot of them are very good and they're very helpful, but sometimes the right advice isn't being given. There's no you, can't, you don't have a single number to ring to get an answer to it? No. May I raise... Well, a minute. Uh, Sorry. D, first of all. Yeah. Um, yes, on, on your point, uh, at, at the particular office that I go to, there is what, what was called the entitlement specialist for whom this young man, he, he was... Um, he went to... He phoned up Perth and he got somebody a low, lower down and they said, no, I'll need to check with the entitlement specialist. So the entitlement specialist came back with this piece of misinformation. Now, it could have been lost in the translation, don't get me wrong. However, it was the wrong information. I knew it was the wrong information because I, I help a lot of these young starter farmers myself. Um, so I filed off an email to David Barnes on Sunday evening and, God bless him, Monday morning, 9 o'clock, I got a response from him, very detailed, um, correcting what the officer had said. So um, I then phoned up the officer and said, did he realise this? And, and he said, no, we've only got the same guidance as you've got. I said, would you like to see this email? So he was very grateful to have the email. So hopefully that particular officer is now aware of, of this particular rule. OK, uh, Charlie Adam and then uh, Russell Smith. Um, on the subject of uh, um, answers from local offices, I mean, I would emphasise what's been said before. I think local office staff are doing their very best in an impossible situation. But purely from a farmer's point of view, you are very lucky if you have Dave Tucker to make a phone call to David Barnes. And there will be many, many people who, who do not do that and who take that advice in good faith. And this doesn't, frankly, apply just to the situation we're in now. But... Uh, over time and in the past, the situation has been that one has received verbal advice from staff, in good faith, I'm sure, from local offices, which has turned out to be wrong. And uh, in my own personal case, uh, I've acted on that advice and it's cost me quite a few thousand pounds, so it's a sore point. Uh, I, I would urge that when advice is given, in good faith or not, that, that there ought to be some written confirmation, whether by email, of the fact that that advice was given, so that the farmer, accepting in good faith, does not then pay the penalty for acting on the basis of wrong information. We'll come to the points about what, how we think it should be handled, given the complexities later on. But you know, you're pointing us in a direction of things that we will be seeing clearly with regard to your fears about penalties and so on that have applied before. But keeping uh, focused on the system as it is now, uh, Russell Smith, and then I'm going to go on from there to ask Sarah Boyack to ask her questions. Yes. Thanks, Camina. Yeah. Just on the point of supporting things, I believe in the Goldsby office there is a terminal which people can go in and use, or a computer, with, with advice. That gets around all the problems of people using their own computers. But that, like a lot of these things, is only really any use if you're actually quite close to the office. And there are people on islands and in remote areas who have no broadband, 
too far to drive into an office. And we mustn't lose sight of the fact there is always going to have to be a paper and post alternative for some people. Yeah. And that has to be kept available. Indeed. Right. Sarah Boyack. Mr. Convener, um, I think there's been an awful lot of um, very, very good feedback. Um, and it does sound like it's been an incredibly difficult period. And some of these issues were highlighted um, when the audit committee looked at the scheme. And some, some have emerged in questions to ministers that some of us have asked over the last few weeks. I think in my head I've got some thoughts about what would it be useful that we as a committee could advise over the next couple of weeks, convener? Because there are clearly thousands of people still to fill in their forms. And I suspect listening to us today um, hearing you is not going to fill them with um, comfort. So maybe thinking about the issue of um, that frequently asked question, national advice, um, and for people who are not comfortable in computers, maybe just doing it on paper this time round while the system gets sorted out. I think, convener, it would also be good to um, pick up any other things that we could do in the immediate couple of weeks to ask ministers for that haven't been mentioned. Um, and then I think... Um, the local offices come out very strongly here as being incredibly useful. So maybe there's something about reinforcing the best practice advice to get people through the next two weeks. But I think I would also, um, either at this point in the meeting or later on, um, it would be good to get um, reassurances from the government about the process of verification. And because of the nature of these forms and the complexity and the um, errors in the system, about um, some, some way this year to take account that people have, um, in all good faith, made errors that could be catastrophic errors, but I think that's something we might want to feed back to ministers. Well, we may make a list as we're going through just now, you know, of things that we think yeah. we've got to get answers on very quickly. So I suppose I'm keen if there's any other couple of things yeah. that are about the two weeks. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think um, before we leave today, it would be good to get um, experience of users just about what things they think will be particularly critical in terms of the processing veri verification stage this year to make sure that um, people don't inadvertently lose out because of the design of the system. Okay. Um, do, does anyone want to respond to that last point just now about what would help in this next couple of weeks most of all? Alec Ferguson? I just wonder if I could uh, uh, make a point that um, I think would be helpful. Um, my understanding is that south of the border, when they, fight, when they did realise that their system was simply not going to work, they um, sent out packs of paper forms preloaded with information from the previous year's application, which saves an awful lot of time when you're coming to fill them all in. Um, and, and just to get it on the record, have the paper forms that when you have filled in a paper form rather than online, has that been a, pre has that been a form that's been preloaded with the information from previous schemes? Um, and is anybody aware of whether or not such forms are available? Because if we're going to meet this deadline, it seems to me we're going to have to have some sort of fast-tracking system. And, the, and you know, the, 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 if, if, if paper forms that were preloaded for each individual farm were available, it would obviously speed up the process considerably. And I just wondered if anybody wanted to comment well, on that. Russell, what did you find? We received uh, paper forms in the post back in the end of March, which were pre-filled in, because in the past we've always done them in paper. Uh, I then received another pack towards the end of May, so that was after the deadline, so I had a letter telling me the deadline had been extended, which they came after the, the deadline. And that had... When, when you say we, can you just confirm who that is? When you say we received paper forms Sorry, already my, filled in? Mycroft. Ah, right, thank you very me, much. Me yeah. personally. Uh, and the second lot of forms I received were also pre-filled in, even though I had submitted them by that time. Alan Patterson and then uh, Jenny. Point, Mr Ferguson is trying to get. If they were submitted electronically last year, as most of the forms were, there was no pre-printed forms available, and they were starting with a blank sheet of paper and a blank map up until Monday evening. On Monday evening, the pre-printed packs, which have been sitting as a contingency since March, all of a sudden, they are now available through the area office when agents and farmers have mostly got them done by writing out the entire thing from a blank sheet of paper. From Monday evening, I believe, 
you can apply to your area office and the pre-printed packs are now available. They have been sitting in a warehouse somewhere and it's the 1st of June date that they've opened them. Okay, Jenny Douglas. Question. Um, before that was, can we get pre-printed forms then? Because we've asked and asked and exactly that. We've been told they're in a vault with a letter saying because the system has gone down, here's your pre-printed copy. Because the system didn't go down, they couldn't send the pre-printed out. So no one was allowed pre-printed if you didn't do it, if you weren't already getting it pre-printed. Mm. So the human error in writing land parcel numbers for that many fields was awful as well. So it's trying to balance out the pros and cons. If we can now get them, we haven't been told in the borders anyway that we can get them, but if we can, um, for some that will speed it up a little bit. Um, so it's good to know. Right. Um, Jim Hume. Yeah. Vina, just a, a comment and then maybe explore a slightly different area. Obviously, the system doesn't seem to be intuitive, therefore I think it might be worth us looking in to see how it was tested before it went live. It doesn't seem to have been any guidance notes sent, sent out, but if, I'm happy to be corrected on that. An online help or national helpline, as Michael Russell mentioned, uh, doesn't seem to have been up to system. And as Alan Patterson has said, the, the crashing system, you lost your info, which is something which, uh, if that seems to be the case, is something we would have to push for. But uh, another issue, I, I, I had an answer to a question yesterday, just regarding uh, the grass let situation, which we're all aware there's some landlords uh, speculatively uh, claiming on, on that. Uh, the government, uh, in an answer to a question yesterday, said that they're uh, researching, uh, commissioned initial research, analysing uh, the importance of seasonally let land but we know that there are, as I said, landlords speculatively uh, claiming, whereas the, what we would call the real farmers are actually still paying rent for that, but have no option to put land let out, or, or, which was LLO, which was a, a, on a forms in the past, I believe, a, on, the, on the new system. So we will, as far as I can see, not be able to actually... Uh, know where the glass, grass has been let out or, or, or not let out. I just wonder if the, that was a situation that some had uh, held Does off. anyone have any information on that point? So, exactly. Michelle. Yeah. I am fortunately in one of the, the farms that has um, traditionally taken seasonal lets. We've eight years, we've, we've taken several farm seasonal lets, and um, our landlord has chosen to take our claim for, for this this. Um, this these fields and things. I'm not able, because of the lease that we've, we've just signed, paying the same rent, unfortunately, for it, I have had to sign a lease to say um, I will not have on our claim form any reference to this farm. We are still seasonally letting it, paying rent for it and farming it, but I've had to sign a form to say I will be unable to have it on my form. Question for the well, landlord, yeah, indeed. It, it, it is, but I mean, the issue is I have it sitting on my form because we've claimed it for the last eight years. So it's sitting on my form, so I have to exclude it, which is impossible. The, 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 the system is you, you, you look at each of the fields, each of the, the um, field identifiers, and you have to consciously exclude it. There's a drop-down that says mapping in process, parcel sold, not used for agricultural purposes, or seasonal let that I don't use anymore. I can't sign that, so I can't exclude it. So I'm now in the position where I, I've signed a lease to say I won't have it on my form, and I can't take it off my form. Well, that's not the form's <laughs> Fault. No. It, well, it is. It's why not have fault. another? Why not have another drop down? Seasonal let still being used. Somebody else making a claim. It's right. It's well, fault. the point's made. Yeah. Perhaps so. Uh, Scott Henderson, first of all. Then. Uh, uh, convener, on this very point, we met uh, this very issue of seasonal lets. We met with cabinet secretary about a month ago. Several of us and quite a number of us are represented within this room, and. Uh, brought the very point up about the landlord grab back of, of land which had been traditionally seasonally, seasonally let. Um, he made very robust statements at that time, but we still question as to whether it has changed the actions of 
if, of any landlords. I'm unaware of that happening, but I'm certainly aware of some, some landlords, quite a number of landlords taking land back in their own hand. Some really big, you know, huge areas of land we're talking about here that's lost to the, the actual active farming, uh, active farmer. And uh, Michelle's point here is, is very, I mean, I've experienced the same thing myself. It's like the new slipper farmers. We have a new breed of slipper yeah. farmers, yeah. yeah. Indeed, and we're aware of that, so the point's well made, and we can reflect that. Uh, any other answers to Jim's point, apart from that? Alan Patterson, yes. I think Jim was referring to the land let out category on the system. The reason why people are not putting land let out is it makes the whole parcel ineligible. For example, a farmer who's farming half his farm and letting out to his neighbour two or three fields. If he puts it on as land let out, that crop code within the online system makes the whole field ineligible. We don't know why. They've been trying to sort it since March and we've been promised an iFix that hasn't happened. Uh, Jenny Douglas. Yeah. It's okay it's to do these Give comments, so it's probably um, uh -huh. not for the online system. Just a uh, response to landlords. Um, technically, a farmer can be active by... I, we, ha we do for both. Um, can grow a crop of grass, put the fertiliser on, and just let the grass for the sheep to graze and aren't breaching the rules. It works both ways, but there are people that are doing extremes, so there's different ways around it. Um, you can, you could put one of the drop downs on the form and submit a letter to explain that you are grazing it. You're allowed to, you are allowed to graze it and not claim it, the landlord claim it because he's growing the crop of grass for you and just put a cover letter in with it. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, right, a question from Graham here to uh, finish up this round, I think, where we try to get to some of the, um, the things that we've got to be saying so that we can sum it all up. If you'll indulge me, give you two questions, really, neither of which is designed to let those responsible for the system off the hook, but to get some sort of clearer perspective here. So for the purposes of clarity, when we embark on the CAP process, everybody says they want a simplified CAP. Then they realise they're going to miss out personally, and the CAP ends up incredibly complex, as we know. You know, people are, are smiling because they recognise that scenario. So we've ended up with an incredibly complicated CAP. To what extent may that have contributed to the problems with the system, simply because it is so complex? So I pose that question. And the second question is we've generally heard about issues with the system that are about functionality and technical problems. I, I recognise that. But just for information purposes, to what extent, extent will broadband speed be playing a part? We talked about you know, downloading maps, etc., etc. So just to get a feel for what difficulties were being encountered under the previous regime when you were trying to, to uh, register online? OK, Charlie Adam. Uh, well, on broadband speed, I would say that is definitely a factor, but I, I also think that there are other factors affecting it. And I would give the example of the mapping system, which seems to take quite a lot to drive and is worse, depending on the system or the connection you have. I'm aware of other mapping systems that do the same thing, which don't have that problem, and I'd have to ask why uh, that, that is the case. The other thing I would say in relation to the complication of the cap is that it obviously has become very complicated, but I think a large factor in all of this is the drip feed of change, which has been going on virtually right up to date. Certainly from a farmer's point of view, with greening rules changing in October, December, and then February, March, uh, I suspect that that would lead certainly somebody like me to hang back over, over committing uh, a, a position in filling up a form simply because of the fact that not only have these changes happened, but frankly they've happened and been notified far, far too late in relation to the, the change. And that, that may be because th th that information wasn't available sooner. I would suspect in some cases because the questions weren't asked soon enough. So it was the Commission that was uh, changing its mind about what was acceptable? Well, in some cases, I think the Commission was changing its mind. In some cases, frankly, I think that, that uh, the Scottish Government left it far too late to go to the Commission and ask the question. 
Well, we can ask that, of course, but uh, we do know that uh, there was very difficulty uh, in pinning down just exactly how the greening would apply. And, of well, course, I everyone's give, concerned about it. Yeah. Mike, I can give one example, which is that, uh, that on the subject of whether or not grass could be sown into fallow land uh, uh, used for environmental focus area, the booklet and the tour uh, carried out by the department in October, November, stated that that could happen and there's actually a film online of the booklet containing that information being handed out. That information changed on the 23rd of December. Uh, there will be people who had made all of their cropping plans and set out their farms on that basis long before that who then found themselves in a position where what they had done had potentially ruled out the other option that they now had to take. And, and that doesn't breed confidence, especially in an ongoing situation. So do we think that this is an issue about the first time this one's been used and that, in fact, it's the sort of things which, you know, we'll begin to see being sorted out? The problems we're experiencing now, I don't think, are to do with the rules. The, you know, the, it's definitely, it's an IT issue. Um, we are finding farmers who haven't met the rules and are phoning up going, partly there's something about greening. The government promised me they'd fix it. What are we doing about it? And that's worrying. Um, because the rules changed so much, I was doing presentations across Scotland every six weeks, and every six weeks it changed. The fallow thing scuppered so many farmers. People have sold livestock we've heard up north because they've... So many. many? I don't know figures, but a lot we've spoken to. Uh, we know of farmers that have had to sell livestock because they ploughed land, ready to put fallow into grass, and don't have enough grass now. Um, it caught a lot of people out. It... The rules, the weightings don't match certain farmers and it, it's lost, it's upset a lot of farmers, it's made it quite difficult for a lot of farmers to meet the rules, but I don't think the problems we're having just now are because of that, it just adds to it. Okay. Yes. Why that change took place in 23rd, was that a European change? And if so, what representations were made by the NFU and others about it? I mean, if it's that inconvenient, what, what was the answer to it? May I First of all, I can say I have actually sat beside Drew Sloan at the moment of announcement and saw the look of shock on his face when he read what was in his own book, which uh, I have to say was interesting. And it was fairly clear that questions were going to be asked. But I, I, I mean, I do think Europe has an element of responsibility here. And there are other things such as the, the question of whether drainage could be carried out on environmental focus area where... The Scottish Government initially took a line that that, uh, that couldn't happen and the, the UK DEFRA took an opposite line and I believe there was an argument going on between them as to which of the two were correct and one or other of them are going to find that they were actually wrong. And so, just so, stick with the fellow land issue. This happened on the 23rd of December, right? So what happened thereafter? I mean, has the, has the department apologised? Have they offered compensation, have people asked for compensation. You, know, you can't just have a change of that and say, oh, that's it, let's move on. What happened? Sorry, Alison, here we go. Um, I was just going to say that my husband and I sat, actually sat down maybe two or three days before the change to decide exactly what we were doing. Um, I went on the government website because I thought that's where I'm going to get the most up-to-date information, and it said we could sow the, the grass seed. Later on that day, I read the NFUS weekly review, which said, no, you can't do this. And I thought, well, it's not very often, actually, the NFU are wrong. Um, so I'm maybe going to go with them and found out that, yeah, in fact, that, and the, the guidance remained there for about five or six days. So people could still be willfully making that choice. And yeah, there was no, I mean, from a personal point of view, we didn't go to the department and say, well, can we have any compensation because we made a decision on this. And I'm, as far as I'm aware, I don't think anybody did. Um, but yeah, people were very upset about it. Yes. 31st December, so there's not a case to argue. It's not come into force yet. Fallow starts 15th of January. So we, we, we shouted a lot about it. Um, because we knew of a lot of farmers that it affected it, made it very difficult for them to come up with another option for it. Um, but it was supposedly came in, and the update, the public update we found, without scouring the website every day, was through their Facebook page. So we found out before our local area office. Um, it's, that's how, that's, that is the way things are moving. That's the way we're finding out changes, is through their Facebook page before read them anywhere else. And our, the decision, we were told, was it was before the, the 1st of January. Friend of the Scottish oh, yes. government. Oh, yes. That'd be good. There you are. <laughs> Come back to Graham Day for uh, yes, supplementary. Just, just to be to be clear, convener. So, 
it is what we're saying that we don't recognise that the complexity of the cap we finished up with has been a factor in this? No. Not at all. It's a very complex cap, but the rules are there that we can apply. But we at the moment have an IT system which all these have to be applied for and through. The old system was user-friendly and we were able to see what we were doing. They've, brought in a whole, they've thrown everything out and started again and people are unused to the rules as well as unused to an unfriendly IT system which was always going to be a recipe for disaster. OK, we've got this far. We've had some suggestions from Sarah Boyack <clears throat> and from Mike Russell about things that need to happen soon. Uh, Sarah suggested uh, frequently answered, asked questions, national advice, uh, paper copies available. We heard that paper copies will be available. Uh, the local offices need to have the exact information that uh, everybody else has and not at a variety of it. And the verification process has got to be something that's uh, friendly to the farmers. And uh, this is all trying to help to make sure that people don't feel in fear that they're going to be penalised. And then there's the ongoing issues related to uh, the verification followed by um, a process that takes into account this system uh, is complex and that people will have made mistakes on it. And therefore, we're seeking some means to allay their fears about penalties and so on. This is the stuff that I'm hearing. Can we add to that just now, to that kind of list that I've just described? Prove the speed of it. For the last two weeks, we're, in the last 48 hours, it's getting slower and slower as of probably demand's getting higher and higher. Is there a way at their end it can, can it take more users or something? Because that's, we've got SRDP to put in too. Yes. That's the worry it's going to just stop. Okay. Some other things to add to that, Mike, yes? An urgent helpline for the last fortnight so that people can ring up at even at 3 o'clock in the morning, maybe a little bit before that, and fight, get definitive help. But the second one is I'm absolutely certain that the advice we should give to, to Richard is that the payments must be made on time and everything is subordinated to that. Uh, it is possible to correct a system over a period of time and get it to work better for next year. The important thing this time is that the price of the difficulties is not paid by the individual farmer. Yes. Okay. Uh, are there any further... Um, sorry, Alex wanted to make a point as well. Yeah, and it kind of follows on from that a bit, Convener. Yep. Thank you very much, because the, the, if, I, if I understand this correctly, and it's distinctly possible that I don't, um, the, 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 the speed of payments will depend on the number of inspections that have to take place between um, the, you know, the verification, during the verification process and all of that. And it seems to me, by what everybody said, that that is going to be impacted on by the same staff who are also going to have to deal with the SRDP uh, situation that Jenny has just brought up. And my, uh, again, my understanding is that SRD app, SRDP applications have to be in by the 13th of this month, not the 15th. Yes. 12th next of this month, Friday. sorry, I beg your pardon, the 12th of this month, being a Friday, that's right. Um, so it seems to me that there is going to be inevitably a consequential impact on SRDP applications if there is it to be any chance of the um, basic payments being made in December, as is obviously everybody's hope. I just wonder if anybody... I mean, are, are we facing a situation, really, where SRD applications are just going to be put on indefinite hold until this verification process has been completed? Charlie Adam? Definitely, that certainly some of the consultants who handle quite a number of the SRDP applications have simply had to say that we can handle none of them uh, because of the difficulties we're having with the Pillar 1 basic uh, application. Uh, and um, I think there had been, had been strong pressure for an extension of the application period to allow uh, them to make those applications, but as far as I'm aware, there's been no movement on that. I don't know whether that movement is something that is giveable. Well, I think it's something which we have to ask yeah. urgently. Yeah. That's, a different, that's a sort of different question than one I asked, because Alex is asking about the pressure on the government system, which I think is very considerable. But that's a very interesting take on that, where in actual fact the application process through consultants is going to be more difficult to do because people can't do everything themselves. I think that demands some sort of uh, change of date. Yes. 
what the SRDP and it's all online now and that's that's the worry I we have said I know a lot of people have refused to do any I've tried and you've got the odd person's persistent and wants one it, that they're at the bottom of the priority we need to get all of the um, applications in first and I have one to try and do in the next 10 days um, but I'm worried that if we can't upload things but that's the only way to do it um, but yeah they seem to have been before and I quite defiant they're not changing the deadline for it okay um, I think we've got that message is loud and clear. Are there any other points to add to our list? Because I think we've got a substantial one and a very informed one from uh, your efforts just now to give us your experience. Um, if you're happy with us to do that, or if there's any points that you wish to make in writing to us, simply write to us. Do not try and send... <laughs> Um, it would be easier for us, indeed, but we'll try and make a, a, you know, a very early effort to, to convey this information as clearly as possible. You can rely on that. I'd like to thank all of you as witnesses for this e excellent session. Uh, a difficult one, but a time of a new cap, I think it's something that's got to get sorted and sorted quickly. And we're on your side as far as that's concerned, as you can see. Uh, and I think we can speak with a united voice on that. The ways of finding the, the answers may be slightly more difficult, as we know. But thank you all for your uh, presence and your evidence, and uh, we will call a short suspension after this to allow witnesses to leave and us to move on to the next public item.
And uh, we'll move on to the next item, which is Public Petition PE01547 uh, from Ian Gordon and the Salmon and Trout Association on the conservation of uh, Scottish wild salmon. The petition calls on the, the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to ensure that no Atlantic salmon are killed before the 1st of July and to end coastal netting of mixed stock fisheries. The committee has heard back from the Minister following its decision to write to her on the petition as part of the Wild Fisheries Review. We also have a response from the petitioner on the correspondence. And I refer members to the paper and invite your comments just now. Who wants to kick off? Graham Day. Thank you, Kimira. I have some considerable sympathy with part one of the petition where it talks about a a ban for a five-year period up to a certain date in the year. Um, however, part two of the petition, where it focuses in on one sector, is, is obviously unfair, I would suggest. Um, so I, th I think that's where I would be at on this. Okay. Um, Mike Russell. Yeah, I think that the Minister has made it fairly clear that she intends, and, and I think the committee had agreed with this, to go ahead with her consultation. Um, it would have to be quicker than perhaps had been talked about, but I don't think it's possible to reach a conclusion on this until the consultation is over. I think the one thing is clear that if there's to be any reduction in take and, and any suspension of take, it would have to apply to all sectors, not just to one sector, and it's quite unreasonable to expect one sector to take all the pain. So if this comes back as it will come back as an issue after the consultation, then I think everybody involved in, 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 in the, the business of taking salmon uh, will have to see major change take place. Any other comments? Dave Thompson? Yes, convener. Thanks very much. I would agree very much with, with Mike Russell. I think we have to let the consultation uh, take its course and, and then you know, consider matters uh, after that. Uh, there is an associated issue which... I think we maybe need to get a bit more information on. Um, just recently, I saw some information about the number of salmon uh, being taken by seals, and it's a, it's a phenomenal amount. And that looks like there's more uh, scientific evidence becoming available in relation to this. And I just wonder if uh, we need to get more information, do a little bit of work just on the impact of the seals in relation to the stocks of salmon. Mm -hmm. Because there's no point in looking at netsmen and anglers if huge amounts of salmon are disappearing in, in the high seas and round the coasts because of seals. And I, I'm not taking a position on this. I want to make that clear. But I would like more information on the latest science and so on. lead us to a certain conclusion at the end of this discussion if we're needing more information. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. And uh, obviously the sustainable um, harvest of, of wild salmon is extremely important and, and others on this committee, including our Convener, have made, made this point in the past and may well do so again. But I, I do think that perhaps this petition is somewhat of a blunt instrument in that it, it has a certain date on it. Um, uh, for, for up to what point there shouldn't be any, any killing of salmon. Um, I do think that the catch and release process has um, functioned much better, but I agree with those members who've raised the point that it should be all sectors who should take the pain, and pain there will indeed be. But uh, when we heard from the Minister um, about the Wild Fisheries Review, um, I did have some concerns about... Um, where the research was going in terms of the science, and I see that the, um, the letter from the minister about the petition has highlighted the concerns about science, and I would want to be sure that there is robust science, scientific evidence going forward on which um, the Scottish Government can make future decisions about the way forward. And uh, Graham Day? Yeah, I think the point about the science is very well made, and, and following on from Dave Thompson's point, we also need to be as assured as we can be about the impact of climate change and the migratory patterns of salmon and how that's impacting on the situation. So gathering the most robust um, and reliable scientific evidence from all sides of this is absolutely imperative. Any further comments? 
I'm just a bit concerned, you know, that the one-sidedness of the petitioner's view, you know, becomes impossible without us reaching scientific conclusions, because there's a sentence at uh, uh, one of the paragraphs by the petitioner which says, mixed stock fisheries cannot be deemed, quote, sustainable, unless one can be certain that all the salmon killed in such fisheries are destined for rivers which have sustainable surpluses. Well, that is not correct. It's not clear. It is not something which um, is balanced because the way in which we work out a sustainable harvest will be on the basis of the stocks of salmon that there are, uh, which as a migratory species will have to be measured in several different ways. And that sentence just doesn't grab the reality. It's a partial view and I don't think that that's a way that the committee would like to be able to take this forward. I think, from what I'm hearing, that we're needing to get information of a scientific-based nat nature. Uh, obviously, uh, the SPICE could, pr could provide us with some background, but we're looking to uh, the review that the government's doing to include that kind of information. So whatever we say just now is going to be something we convey to the government to get that information so as to clarify these points about what sustainable harvests actually are. Now, um, that means that we reach a point where because this petition is open and because it's inconclusive and because we've got more questions like Dave Thompson's one about the need to know the impact of seals, in a scientific way, uh, that these these questions need to be answered. And I believe that um, I'm just going to suggest that we have to keep this petition open in order that we get some more answers for that uh, and that we come back and speak with the petitioner in due course. And that could be once we get the outcome of the review or whatever, but that this feeds into the, the review and this is helpful for us to be able to suggest to the minister things that we need to know. Would you like to add to that anywhere, or is that, that fair enough? Agreed. Yeah. Yes. Can Sarah. I agree with that? I think that's very sensible. I think um, both the review, which will give us some of this um, really crucial scientific information, but also the forthcoming secondary legislation. I yeah. think with your suggestion to keep this petition open, it means that we consider the points in this petition yeah. when we get that secondary legislation. I think the only thing is we'd like it as soon as possible to get on with addressing the issue. Yeah, I think that's a point very well made that adds to what I was saying. So we'll we go forward with that process. There's a lot to find out. It's time we knew more about it before we, we do anything else. So we will let the government know our view and uh, we will keep the petition open. OK, thank you. Uh, we agree to that action and writing. Now, the next item is agenda item seven. Again, on public petitions, seventh item on our agenda today is to consider a correspondence from the Public Petitions Committee on PE01542 on human rights for dairy farmers. I refer members to the paper and invite any comments that members may have. Mike Russell. Um, I have worked with the Mundells as the constituency MSP for Agar and Butte. I, uh, m my view is, uh, and it has been the view of, I believe, both of my predecessors as the MSP for Agar and Butte, that this distressing matter can only be dealt with in the courts. Uh, there was a democratic decision of the farmers in Kintyre to um, have the ring fence and a, the only way that that could be declared to be illegal would be to have a judicial review of the decision. This was a very long time ago, taken by a Tory government. It was supported in the area and across Scotland, and I don't believe any benefit would come from any further activity on a petition which is immense. Well, I think this is the second or third petition. I think this has to be a matter for the courts. And the review... Um, and the, 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 that advice has been given to the Mundells by a number of people, including myself. Any further comments? Angus MacDonald. Yes, thanks, um, Convener. As a member of the Public Petitions Committee, I, I made my views clear uh, at that committee, and uh, they are on record. Um, with regard to the, um, the official report, it's worth, from the PPC Committee, it's worth noting uh, Dave Stewart, MSP's comment, uh, that the petitioners have contacted more than 50 lawyers 
uh, to no avail um, or, and with no satisfactory outcome uh, for the petitioners. It's also, I think, uh, worth placing on record again uh, that the Scottish Human Rights Commission has advised the PPC Committee uh, that only a court could rule on the issue, uh, and that should be taken on board. Um, given that uh, um, we, we are where we are with regard to the situation, um, I, I think we should write to the PPC Committee advising that uh, the petition should be closed. Alec Ferguson. Uh, just very briefly, um, Convener, I've, I've um, followed uh, the Mundell's concerns over this issue in the, through the pages of the Scottish Farmer for many, many years. Um, and I, I feel very sorry for them because it's clearly become a burning issue. Um, but I, I just want to put on record the fact that, uh, uh, as Mike Russell rightly said, this whole situation has been the result of a democratic decision that was taken. Um, uh, and one cannot do anything about a subject that, um, as Angus MacDonald has just said, is widely recognised that the only resolution can be through the courts, if there is a resolution, which I suspect there isn't. So I uh, endorse, um, for the record, the action that's proposed. So I think we're getting the impression that we should write to the petitions committee with these views and that uh, we should leave them to convey that to the uh, petitioner. Have we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, we move on to say that at the next meeting of the committee, we will be in Kirkwall Grammar School in Orkney to begin pre-legislative scrutiny of the Scottish Government's proposals on land reform. Like all committee meetings, this is a public event and tickets can be obtained via the Parliament's website. As agreed earlier, we will now move into private session to consider item 8 on evidence hearing this morning. I close the public part of the meeting and ask the public gallery to be cleared. <laughs>